that better? Looks good. You see, fine. I can see Demetrius there as well and Stan. Hi, guys. Hi, nice to see you, Peter. Good to see you too. How are we all keeping? Well, all yes, right. I will sit. <laughs> Your virtual background is playing upstairs, love. Yes. <laughs> That's the challenge with them. That's why I have a green yeah. screen. Because of the white. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's better. You're looking good now, sir. And Metin, how are you, Metin? Hi, Perry. How are you? Good morning. Good, good, good. It's very bright behind you, Metin. I don't know if you can just slightly... The the um, yeah move the camera or just put the, the, the blinds a little bit because it's a very well bright this is so, well this is the only thing that I can do now I'm in the ah. office okay perhaps go to your right a little bit because otherwise we can't see your face that's a bit better maybe a bit more okay. if you can manage it that that's good hi Serena how are things in Italy Buonasera. <laughs> Buongiorno, good morning, no. and good afternoon, and <laughs> good evening. That's good right, where you are in the world. <laughs> yeah, things in Italy are okay, we're surviving. <laughs> yeah, so I was seeing you have another way. That's the trouble, it's not really daytime, because everyone's here at different times. I can, the good thing is I can easily switch to being at night time here in Kale as Wonderful. well. Wonderful. <laughs> oh, maybe we should go for more of an evening look, which fits with where I'm at at the moment. We'll go with the, maybe I'll go with the, the evening look <laughs> where I'm at, just to give everyone a different time of day that they're at, given it's morning with you guys and uh, with uh, you and, and uh, Demetrius and Metin, it must be what, lunch? What, what's it with you? It's all, Almost uh, lunchtime, morning? yes. Okay. Well. Okay. Nine o'clock in the morning here, mate. I know. I'm on my <laughs> cup of coffee <laughs> well we missed you on the editor's panel in australia it was only what it was only like four o'clock in the morning four o'clock really... in the morning exactly yeah <laughs> well that was understandable <laughs> occasionally i wake up if i need to but <laughs> yes i know that's the trouble with this whole zooming thing we uh, we do end up living in uh, all sorts of different people's time zones all around the world so yeah i'm trying to organize something that will have people from Australia, New Zealand, and Hawaii at the same time, and that's a little bit tough. Oh, wow. that's that's Mission Impossible, Demetrius. Yeah. Well. <laughs> and Joe, just good to see you in Japan. How are things there today? Well, you are everyone. Very good, thank you. Oh. It's a nice sunny day, twenty degrees and sunny, so I'm not complaining. Ah, oh. okay. It's lovely. Good, good, good. All right, well, I think we've got, I'm um, pleased to say, looks like we've got everybody here and with a good connection. I can, I can personally hear all of you very clearly and you can hear each other okay? Yep. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, that's brilliant. That's a, that's a bit of a first, if nothing else. <laughs> Metin, I keep losing, that's it, don't move. Whatever you do, Metin, don't move. Yeah. We keep, okay. you keep, I keep losing, you, suddenly your face just goes a bit blank. So. Okay. All right. Well, look, I um, um, just see if we've got anybody else uh, online. I know everyone else has been having lunch, so uh, we'll uh, it's given the the, uh, the time in India. So let's see if uh, when they, when everyone else is coming back, um, if we've got everyone there, that's fine. Uh, now I'm going to try. Can I get? Oh. I was just trying to work out how to get everybody to smile. I was going to do a screenshot to get a photograph of us all. So I think, oh, no, but I, how is this going to work? Um, ha, this is a bit tricky. Um, I'm going to try and put Control, us on the Control, Alt, uh, Format. Yeah, yeah, I've got that. It's just trying to get everybody in the picture. <laughs> I don't know, because on leave, my screen, my screen... Leave you're stand not, out. At least... <laughs> Actually, I don't have it. Yeah, that's a, how do I get everyone in here? I've got a gallery view, but oh, I'll true. do it. Can you? Because I've got a yeah. couple of blank squares on mine, unfortunately. Yeah, that's how it's it's showing up. Oh dear, never mind. We'll see how we can get us all. 
Okay, I've got something that's looked okay. Hopefully that's, oh dear. All right. No, just not. Got too many, I've got some blank boxes in there in my screen for some reason. Never mind, never mind. We'll, work, we'll go with what we've got, as they say. Uh, now, have we, I don't, I guess we'll just wait for Sabura to come on if he wants to do the introductions. If not, we'll just get started, I think. Eric, what you've prepared is unbelievable. I've never seen anything like that. <laughs> well, well <done> I, <laughs> uh, I, I just wanted, I had a nasty feeling that technology might not be with us, so I was just hoping to be as prepared as possible. But in fact, uh, amazingly, uh, this is working out so far so good. So I'll keep my fingers Hello? crossed and it works out. Hello. Can I have your attention, please, here? Thank you. So, Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're joining us from today. My name is Abhijit Abraham. I'm one of the scholars over here. Then welcome to the workshop on publishing in top tier tourism and hospitality journals held at the Global Hospitality and Tourism Conference, GSTC 2020 in Shillong, India. Before we begin the session, we would like to lay some ground rules for the participants. We request apartments to kindly switch off their mic until advised otherwise. During the initial part of the session, discussion between the editors will be based on the most common queries that we had received well in advance. Participants are requested to raise their questions via the chat window. Also, the participants will be allowed a window for the raised questions to be addressed by the panel towards the end of the session. We hope to have questions that are within the context of the theme of this session. We also hope that participants will remain attentive throughout the session, as well as refrain from limit and refrain as well as limit the number of repetitive or similar questions. So, without any further ado, we would like to request Professor Perry Opson, who is the Pro Vice Chancellor for Global Engagement, Sunway University, in Malaysia, to kindly take over the session. Thank you all, wish you all the best. Well, thank you very much for that introduction and uh, good afternoon, good evening and good morning, wherever you might be in the world. Uh, we've got a great uh, panel here of editors uh, who are joining this conference. So uh, we'd like to extend our thanks for the, for the invitation for that and hope over the next uh, uh, about hour and 45 minutes to deal with a range of different questions. Uh, and uh, I think uh, we'll try and make the session as interactive with the discussions based on the questions we've got. And obviously we're very keen to get additional questions too uh, along the way. So uh, as I mentioned, as has been mentioned, uh, my name is uh, Perry Hobson. I'm based at Sunway University in Malaysia, and I've been the editor in chief of the Journal of Vacation Marketing for about 20 years. And it gives me great pleasure today to chair this panel of editors. Um, the, in terms of the format, uh, the way we're going to, we thought to run this panel was by getting each of our editors to briefly introduce themselves. And then what I'm going to do is ask them after that to introduce sort of one hot topic or pressing issue, pressing issue that they see uh, that's been um, impacting the world of publishing journals uh, and tourism hospitality research. Now, following on from that, I've taken the questions that we uh, had submitted and I put them into sort of four different rounds of questions. Uh, for, so each of the editors will deal with those. Uh, but of course, I know other editors would love to jump in and got their own thoughts because believe me, uh, editors have uh, come in many different shapes and sizes and we've got very different journals and we face quite different issues as well given the focus and the type of journal that, that we've got. So we look forward to receiving those additional questions from, from you, our audience. Um, and uh, hopefully we've selected questions to address a range of different issues and different levels. Because I'm assuming we have quite a mixed audience here today, uh, covering PhD students, early career researchers, right through to those of you who may have a lot of experience in having submitted many papers. 
So let me start by making a quick observation that over the last 30 years, not only has the world of publishing changed, but uh, with many more journalists in hospitality and tourism than ever before. Now, the world of academia has also changed with considerably more pressure to publish than when I started as a young assistant professor back in 1988 in the States. Now, over the years, we've also seen many more journals being published, uh, particularly in English, and yet many of them are also coming from countries where English is not necessarily the mother tongue or the main language. We've also seen the output uh, of research output from many universities and countries, such as South Korea and China, that was simply not a feature of academic output over 20, 30 years ago. In fact, I can remember being quite excited when I was uh, the early editor of JBM getting a paper from China. So how things have changed. Now, this changing land, change and shift in the landscape is by no means complete because after all, research and publishing nexus is a complex global one. We don't have time to address all those issues today. Instead, this panel is going to deal with more pragmatic issues of things for researchers to do if they look to publish their research in top tier journals. But I am always mindful of keeping abreast of the bigger picture of what's going on. So now it gives me great pleasure to welcome our esteemed editors. And I'm gonna ask each of them in turn to just give a little, a few words about their journal, uh, the focus, uh, aware that not everybody may know about each of the journals that's represented here today. So, um, you know, I'll uh, start off with, uh, with uh, if I may, Dimitris, Professor Dimitris Bahanas. Uh, Dimitris, it's wonderful to see you here today. Welcome. Tell us a little bit about uh, Tourism View. Namaste. First of all, thank you very much for the invitation. Wonderful to see you all. Um, tourism Review, which is there, it's the most established journal in tourism, started in 1946, just after the Second World War. Wow. And now it's 76 years of publications. Uh, I was not, uh, I didn't start the journal in 1946. Obviously, uh, there are a lot of colleagues that they've started before me. Uh, I took over uh, two th 2017. And since then, I've been driving the journal to a different kind of uh, uh, level. Uh, we became part of the SSCI and we uh, uh, publish uh, now uh, 80 papers per year. Uh, the paper has grown significantly. It's a generic paper, so we take uh, almost any kind of tourism papers. Increasingly, we don't accept hospitality papers because we leave it for hospitality journals. Uh, and we are very global on our uh, nature. I, I cannot help it but mention what takes most of my time right now, which is the Encyclopedia of Tourism Management and Marketing, which um, I'm editing the, the final things. And also, you know, I'll, I'll bring some expertise from the Encyclopedia on the panel as well. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Demetrius, for that. And uh, if you had been the inaugural editor, I would have asked what your secret is, because uh, that would have been quite an achievement to keep your good looks over so many years. So thank you very <laughs> much for that, Demetrius. Now let's go to Japan. Joseph Chip, Professor Chip, it's wonderful to welcome you joining us from Japan today. And you're the editor-in-chief of uh, Tourism Geographies. Thank you, Perry. Thank you, everyone. Um, uh, well, firstly, thanks to Sarah uh, Dixon for the, the invitation and, and greetings to eminent colleagues. So I, I have to make one slight uh, acknowledgement. Um, I'm the co-editor-in-chief with um, uh, uh, Dr. Mary Mostafanejad from the University of Hawaii. The journal was actually started by Professor Alan Liu, and most of you will know Alan Liu. It was uh, issue one came out in 1999, at the, before the turn of the last century. And the emphasis of the journal uh, is very much on tourism geographies, as, as you would suspect, but drawing from geographies, especially human geographies, we like to say we are the preeminent journal that um, publishes papers at the nexus between tourism and geographies, right? No one else does, it's just us. So, <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's, a, it's a good byline to have. So we publish multidisciplinary works on, on tourism and related fields such as recreation, leisure studies and regional traditions from a geographic standpoint. We have a lot of, um, I, I would say the vast majority of the work comes from multidisciplinary scholars. So it presents a, a, its, 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 its um, reasonable set of challenges, but in some ways, like Dimitrios has just said, um, we have to be selective. We can't publish everything and we have to try and stick to the, the aims of the journal, right? 
because we always say to authors, you know, um, um, look at the aims of the journal and, 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 and make sure that your paper is best fit. So um, uh, with that, uh, we, we've also started a, a, a kind of offshoot called Tourism Geographic. We've kind of stolen the National Geographic um, uh, moniker. And basically the whole idea of uh, Tourism Geographic is to take academic research and write it in a way somewhat like the conversation um, so that it's available to a wider range of people because that's a challenge for all of us as editors. How do we move beyond the academy so that people read our research? Um, so that's about it, Perry. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much for that, uh, that overview of the journal. I always find it very interesting because, as I mentioned, there's, there's so many journals and, and in my area, more of the marketing area, I'm quite familiar with those. And as the field grows, it's uh, often uh, you don't fully grasp what's going on in other areas. So I really do appreciate that. Now let's go to uh, Bulgaria. And it's my great pleasure to welcome Professor Stanislav Ivanov. Uh, who is the Editor-in-Chief of the European Journal of Tourism Research. So welcome Stan and perhaps you can give us a little bit of an overview of the journal. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. It is a great honor to, to be part of this uh, panel. Uh, the European Journal of Tourism Research, uh, in difference to the, other, uh, to the other journals that are presented uh, in the panel, is a regional journal. So we have a, a clear uh, European focus. So it is an, uh, uh, this means that uh, empirical studies within the journal need to have either a European context or at least clearly stated implications for the European tourism uh, industry. Um, the journal is uh, open access. It is a real open access journal, which means that uh, there are no submission fees uh, there uh, and uh, all the publications are available uh, free of charge uh, uh, for readers. It is published by uh, Varna University of uh, Management. And uh, it started in uh, 2008, so now it is uh, the, 14th, uh, the 14th year. We usually receive something like um, 400 submissions per year, and we publish about uh, 40 papers, which means that the acceptance rate is, uh, uh, is around 10%. Right. Otherwise, okay. uh, we are open to, um, uh, any topic related to tourism and hospitality, as long as uh, it fits uh, the scope of the journal, is uh, welcome. All right. Well, thank, thank you. you very much, sir, Stan. And it, it's again, if, you, if the audience might be able to pick up, it's interesting listening to the history of different journals. Demetrius, there going back to really an industry grouping, I think, that really started uh, um, uh, Tourism Review, uh, you know, to publishers, to universities. So journals have often got very different histories not only from their academic perspective, but, but also where they've come, uh, you know, how they, they got established in the first place. So Metin, uh, let me welcome Professor Metin Kozak, who's the Editor-in-Chief of uh, Anatolia, who is joining us from Turkey today. Metin, hello. You're on mute. Hi there, Metin, can you hear us? Uh, good afternoon, Perry from Turkey. I'm sorry, are, are you able to hear myself? There are some, you know, good. connection problems on my computer. No, all is good. Okay. So Anatolia yeah, was created uh, in 1990 in Turkey. It was originally in Turkish in the beginning. And we decided to make it more international in 1997. So it became in English. So we have two versions of Anatolia now. One in Turkish, more for domestic scholars in Turkey. And the other one is uh, the English version of Anatolia, which is uh, Anatolia International Journal of Tourism and Hospitality Research. Well, we started with two issues in the beginning, but now have four issues. And we welcome any kind of you know, submissions on tourism, hospitality, leisure and recreation research. The number of uh, submissions is, is in, in, still increasing. So we have, we have more than 300 uh, submissions last year. And we not only welcome full papers, we also encourage people to submit the book reviews, especially research notes and uh, conference notes and so on. We also published a greater number of, you know, portraits of tourism scholars, the leading tourism scholars in the world. So we finished, it was about 80 
different, uh, you know, yeah, the portraits of 80 different uh, international scholars. And beginning from two, 2011, uh, we started working with Tyler and Francis Rutledge. So now uh, Rutledge is the uh, owner of this journal in the last uh, tw uh, 10 years. Okay. And Metin, if I might just ask, because I, I, I've learned something today, I didn't realize there was still a Turkish version of the journal. So they published both versions of that for you? No, no. Well, we didn't approach the publisher because, uh, you know, there is a marketing problem. It's more right. domestic and, you know, so, so we, we just support, you know, publish the, the Turkish version with our own efforts. Okay. And it is online as well. Right. Okay. That's interesting because, again, this is some of the challenges that we often have as we work across different languages and, and so forth in different countries. And so that, that's, that's interesting. Thank you so much, Martin, for that, uh, for that quick overview there. Now let me welcome uh, Professor Dr. Serena Volo uh, from Italy. It's wonderful to see you with the beautiful backdrop of uh, Brunico I can see there in, uh, in Sud Tyrol, the northern part of the country. Um, and she joins us as the Editor-in-Chief of the International Journal of Culture, Tourism and Hospitality Research. Welcome, Serena. Thank you. Thank you for the kind invitation. And uh, good morning, good afternoon or good evening, uh, wherever you are. It is a pleasure to be here. A few words about the journal. Uh, I took over the journal as editor-in-chief in 2017. The journal was uh, an idea, an original idea, I would say, of uh, Professor Archwood side. It's a 15-year-old journal. It is an emerald uh, journal. And uh, we get, a, as to last year, we get about 300 submissions with an acceptance rate of about 8%. So the journal has increased visibility and uh, therefore we got uh, a good number of submissions, but mm -hmm. we can accommodate a few papers. Therefore, we look for high quality papers in the field of uh, and consumer behavior in tourism and hospitality. Of the journalists to look into uh, interdisciplinary and multicultural work in uh, sociology, psychology, even geography and consumer behavior and marketing in tourism and hospitality. The distinguishing feature of the journal is really on the role of culture and how culture shapes uh, uh, tourism and hospitality in our field. So the submissions that we're looking for are in this direction. The type of submission that accept are the full-length papers, the research note papers, and also cut-edge short commentaries on topics that are really contemporary and maybe they can develop newer streams of research. Yes, that would be okay. uh, great at the moment. Well, that's fine. Well, thank you, Sarah, for that. And it, it's interesting to hear, you know, the distinctive because, as you mentioned, many journals have a distinctive feature. And sometimes, as I said, depending how familiar uh, uh, other academics and our colleagues are, whether, how clearly that comes across. And I think that's something as the field gets increasingly crowded with journals so that um, uh, people under, you know, submitting authors understand what the key focus is and often what editors are looking for to, to help reinforce that. So last but not least, let me turn to my associate editor and colleague, Dr. Gabby Walters, who's joining us from Brisbane, from the University of Queensland. And uh, as you can see, uh, JBM is a marketing journal and she wins them, along with Stan is winning and Demetrius is winning the marketing prizes for having the biggest backdrop as well. So Gabby, <laughs> welcome, it's great to see you here this evening. Tell us a little bit about JBM. Thank you, Perry. Um, and you can correct me if I'm wrong in this, being the editor in chief. But so JBM um, started up about in 1994, and it's uh, it started. Its initial focus was to be an applied journal um, that was targeted towards practice, but um, it's since um, become more theoretical in focus, but still keeping that applied. Um, angle as well. So it's a marketing journal. It's all about destination marketing. It's all about tourist behavior. So to all those marketers out there and all those people that um, that play in that area, um, 
uh, JVM is a great place for um, any marketing related research that is um, relevant to tourism, obviously, and any research that's relevant to tourist behaviour. Yeah, and as you pick, it's again, as Gabby's pointed out there, it's, it's a, having that distinctive focus and JVM in particular looks for applied papers. And again, it's that, that interesting thing. In fact, the history of the journal was a small publisher. Uh, now, the, which the journal then moved to a larger publisher, Sage. Uh, in, in the old days, we used to publish uh, papers that were written by practitioners, which we haven't done now for about 10 years. But again, the roots of the journal stretch back to that. So again, a bit of a different history. And as a result of that, a slightly different uh, position. Now, while I've got you on, Gabby, um, what I've asked each editor to do is to identify one sort of pressing sort of issue that they would like to, you know, briefly talk about is being their issue of concern that they're seeing, which is happening in our field, particularly with publishing, etc. So, Gabby, you've got some concerns about how people, when they submit papers, make this make this point about the contribution that they're making in terms of their paper and the difference between the theoretical contribution and a contribution to knowledge. What, what do you see as the issue? there or the problem being? Um, so Perry, I think one of the main issues, and it's not just with the authors, I think it's, it's across journals in particular, in that there are claims made with regards to a contribution to theory that really isn't a contribution to theory. There's a fantastic paper, and if I can um, somehow share it with the audience um, after this presentation, it was written by Zer Shapira, and it's called, I've got a theory paper, do you? And it's uh, conceptual, empirical, and theoretical contributions to knowledge in the organizational sciences, which is and, and social sciences. And I think we get all caught up because it's a necessity a lot of the time. Um, well, it's perceived to be a necessity to have your paper submit um, accepted that it needs to have a contribution to theory. Not all papers in tourism actually. I would argue that you know. 50% most of papers in tourism make a contribution to theory, but they're passed off as a contribution to theory, which further confuses people because they're like, well, why isn't my paper? There was a segmentation analysis um, on visitors going to Greece um, accepted as a contribution to theory when another paper about a segmentation study on tourists traveling to Australia was accepted because it said it had a contribution to theory segmentation analysis isn't necessarily a contribution to theory, but it can be a great contribution to knowledge. And there is nothing wrong with a contribution to knowledge because it's all those little pieces of knowledge that come together to make these theories. But theories, are um, they're big deals. Often many of us in our entire career won't create or develop a theory. Because Theories need to be tested, they need to be refuted, they need to be able to be falsified. Um, and that takes a lot of work and a lot of publication, a, a lot of, sorry, research and a lot of studies. So if we think about the theory of evolution, what does that tell us? The theory is an explanation as to why things, or a proposed explanation as to why things occur and how they occur, okay? So think about your research in terms of whether you are really making a contribution to theory or you're, simply, you're contributing to knowledge and knowledge we need to know. Knowledge that is new and novel, but not necessarily theoretical. All right, I think that's a really good point. Clear up, uh, yeah. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you for that, Kevin, because I think that's a really good point. And I think it's a, a point which a lot of people, a lot of academics when they're submitting papers get confused on, um, you know, because people are asked to make a contribution uh, I know a lot of reviewers give us the, you know, the question, so what? What does this paper do? Mm -hmm. And we get often a simple thing back about that. And I, and I think putting that out there is a, is a really important point. So thank you for that. And I'm going to now move quickly on to, uh, to Stan. It sounds like um, one of your concerns, I, I think one of the issues we've often raised as editors is the challenge we have of finding enough people to be reviewers. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And I know that as uh, Gabby and I have been working with JDM, we've seen a huge increase in the number of papers as more and more pressure seems to be put on academics to publish. But there seems like I, I get the thing there's more of a reticence of academics to actually review, maybe because they're so busy writing papers, I don't know. But it does seem to me this is an important contribution. So Stanley, what's, what's your concern here and why do you think it's important for academics to be a reviewer? 
Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, this is really a pressing issue because uh, besides our roles as authors, uh, uh, we also want, uh, well, when we want our papers to be, um, to be reviewed by others, we also need to give back to the community. So it is, it is very important that we also review others' papers. Um, editors, as you said, uh, often struggle finding uh, appropriate reviewers or at least sufficient number of reviews for the papers. So uh, to have two, three reviews of a paper, then uh, editors often need to send, um, to send invitations to six, seven, sometimes even 10 or more, uh, or more uh, reviewers. And uh, good reviewers, they are in high demand which means that uh, it's highly unlikely that, uh, they, will uh, that uh, they will be able to uh, submit the review. So uh, probably uh, the, the first and most important reason why it is important to be a reviewer from a, how to say, from, a, uh, from the perspective of the community as a whole is to give back to the community. So if you want to publish in a journal, then you should also review them uh, mm. for that journal. Also, um, also being a reviewer helps you uh, see the manuscripts, the manuscript through the eyes of the reviewer. So every paper has uh, uh, different, um, how to say, um, different, re uh, different readers. The first reader, this is obviously the editor, but after that, it is the reviewers. So um, there will be different pairs of eyes that will see the paper before it goes to the, fin to the final readers uh, of the paper. And uh, that's why it is important to see, uh, uh, to see how readers, uh, sorry, how, how reviewers will read your own manuscripts later. So um, also being a reviewer helps gain skills in critically evaluating uh, papers. Uh, it al uh, also uh, learn about, about uh, latest methodologies or latest research before it gets published because uh, you will see, um, um, because reviewers will see the papers uh, several months before that paper is eventually published, if it is published. Also being a reviewer gives, um, uh, gives, recommend, uh, gives uh, inspiration for one's own research. So seeing what others are doing may help you generate ideas for your own research. And uh, finally, uh, probably because we are all human beings and uh, we are also concerned about some subjective reasons like uh, getting, uh, getting appreciation uh, for in the research community and uh, build reputation. This is also something that, uh, uh, that can be achieved by uh, reviewing papers. So there- well, Thank you for that. Yeah, yeah. I, I couldn't agree with, I think I agree absolutely every point you've made. I, I've said so often to young, uh, to young reviewers and those uh, in the community that it's not only just about giving back, you're actually helping yourself because by reviewing, you learn those critical skills. You're seeing it through other people's eyes for all those reasons that you mentioned. And um, I, 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 I can't I only obviously speak for JVM, uh, but clearly I don't think a lot of editors are, are, are challenged to find enough reviewers. We're, we're getting so many papers coming in and it is a matter of community. And um, I, Obviously, each of us have got different ways we approach people, but I know I'm very pleased to be approached by people who want to put their hand up and, and to do more. Now, Metin, this brings us on to a more fundamental issue, pressing issue that you felt you'd, you'd, you'd like to tackle today, which is quite a fundamental one, which is, you know, why do we really need journals? Uh, thank you, Kari. I, let's say that to find the answer for this question, I think it's better to look at the history of uh, journals. Mm -hmm. when the first uh, journals were created in the 17th century, okay? The first journals in the world were created in 1665 in London and in Paris. I think the one in London is ab was about uh, the philosophy. Mm -hmm. Okay, the name is Philosophical uh, Transactions of the Royal Society of London. And the one in Paris is about something, well, Journal de... Chicoanas. I think it's, it could be something again about the philosophy. Okay, and before that, people, and mainly those people, you know, thinking or write, uh, writing about uh, the philosophical things, they used to be ch exchanging ideas or knowledge with each other by writing letters to each other. Okay, 
And they said, okay, the, the, you know, the cumulative amount of knowledge, I think, must be increasing. And they perhaps want to control all this knowledge. And then they decide to, uh, perhaps the idea can also be more professional. And they decide to publish, you know, the professional or more academic or scientific, uh, you know, ed uh, edition or version of uh, this uh, uh, journals that we use today. Well, the idea was just to exchange the knowledge, okay? Not, well, it seems that the, the role or the, the, the mission of journalists now has changed. So they have become more personal or more institutional, but the main idea should be how we can exchange knowledge and how we can find solutions for the, let's say, society or industry or the, you know, let's say, the world, the life. Okay, this is the well, uh, the, the tricky. Well, I uh, think, yeah, I think it's a really good point. And, and, and as you said, going back, and I admire you for doing your history on when journals started and uh, glad to find out the first one started in England, because obviously that's where I'm from and that we were able to beat the French. So that's great. Uh, always good history. Uh, <laughs> Um, but it does make a good point. And of course, as technology, obviously journals could only be printed once we got the Gutenberg Press who allowed things to be printed. And so again, technology has taken off uh, along that. And, and obviously now with open access and the internet, how knowledge is transmitted uh, and these days has changed again. And yeah, well, the, the French yeah. Revolution had a big impact on the you know, dissemination mm -hmm. of all these journals, yes. Yeah, that's right. So again, we're at another sort of interesting point too, which talking about technology and so forth, that takes me over to Dimitris, because one of the issues you'd raised was about uh, smart and ambient, uh, uh, um, smart and uh, intelligent tourism. So what's your sort of issue, the pressing issue you're finding? Um, but as, a, as a bad student, I think I misread the question. Uh, <laughs> so you were asking the you were asking about publications and I was thinking about generic uh, issues in tourism. And of course, smart tourism is, is uh, probably one of the most critical uh, issues right now that we need to look into uh, for restarting tourism uh, internationally. Having said that, I'll kind of make a link back to publications and be mm -hmm. a good student and improvise on, on the last minute of the exam. And what you have is a situation where you know, the, all the publications and all the journals kind of uh, uh, way of getting information out, it's a little bit archaic. In fact, it hasn't changed for many, many years. We are sending a paper in, it's admitted in tourism review. Uh, we are very, very quick as many people know, because, you know, in 30 days we are doing reviews, back maximum 35 days. Um, we've gone around in 32 days. It's the average average um, uh, length of of, um, of reviewing. But I think still we'll have three or four reviews, which will take uh, a paper about a year to appear. Yeah. And by that time, things have moved forward <laughs> a lot, yeah. especially on issues like COVID. You know, I met in. Uh, submitted a very nice paper in Tourism Review, and we did very quickly, we published very quickly, and it's very, very useful to a lot of people. I think we kind of need to find out how we can use the journals very efficiently to bring things out quickly, but also use a range of other media as well that they're going next to the journals. So the blogs, the social media, the Twitters, and, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, increasingly vlogging and videos and all of those things to actually bring content out. And, and what you see now is a new generation of, of editors. You know, I keep following Joseph on what he's doing on Facebook and on Twitter and everything else. And we're very active on those things. And we're getting, we're getting the information out as soon as it happens. So we are much faster than some of the, some of the very old journals. And, and you see, you know, what Sarah is doing with Annals um, they, uh, we are always pushing the content out because we kind of feel that 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 um, it's a smart way of actually using uh, science, and we're trying to make an impact not not only in terms of how many people are citing our papers and this kind of uh, uh, impact factors and stuff, but also impact to society because a lot of the stuff that is written 
uh, is actually uh, never seen. And, and I think for those, those people who are following us and they are listening to what we're saying is that when you are choosing a journal, you really need to, to choose a journal that gonna, is gonna look into your thing, into your, into your research very quickly and efficiently and do a good job giving you justice, but also make it relevant to industry and bring it back out to society as soon as possible. And then use all the other kind of uh, media that we've got to engage with, with the global society. And something else, uh, now, now I've got the microphone. Can I just say- <laughs> Yes, well, okay. from, well, we'll let you have one more, okay. <laughs> yeah. and because I get a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, papers from India. And, and colleagues in India, they're just sending me uh, papers that they are really about the, the village of their, of their mother. This is the village of my mother syndrome, uh, as I call it. So they're very interested on one particular location and they know everything about this particular location, the papers for that particular location. But I struggle to publish it in Tourism Review as an international journal. And it always goes back and says, guys, what you do, has it got an impact to global society? And that's part of the smartness thing that can we improve society globally? Thank you, Perry. No, well, I, I actually, thank you very much for linking it back there to India. And I must say, I think um, uh, you've recovered your, uh, your, um, your bad student thing with 10 out of 10 there, because I think the link you made there with the, with the way that we're becoming smarter and the way to deliver, because for some papers, and I know I was feeling this, you know, our publication timelines were getting longer and longer. And the information we were printing, publishing was actually getting older and older from when the research was done, reviewed, re-reviewed, resubmitted, finally published two years later. And as you've seen in the last world, uh, the last year with COVID, uh, we've managed to launch entire vaccines in, in less than that time. So the world really has been. And that key point there, I think, has come out about making sure that you're understanding the type of papers that journals are interested in. Many journals are being besieged by papers so what's that focus? And I'm very pleased earlier on the session, people were giving that distinctive focus of their journal uh, to make that point. Okay, which now brings me on to, um, uh, to uh, Serena. You had raised the issue of the, um, the issue of publishing or perishing. And you know, your view as a gatekeeper on the value of scientific work. Over to you. <laughs> Thanks, Barry. Well, yes, as a gatekeeper, as an editor, we are all gatekeepers in this role. We, uh, I tend to see, but I think all of us tend to see, and uh, this increasing pressure, particularly on the younger scholars, uh, to publish. Publisher page is not a new thing. Certainly in the last 10 years, uh, it is growing in terms of uh, culture of publisher parish. And maybe this is, uh, in my humble opinion, not the way to, um, to go. And therefore, the issue uh, would be to really educate our young scholars uh, to more of a portfolio. Something that I do remember when I was still a university student. Mm -hmm that a university professor was a, a woman or a man of culture in a wider sense. And this balance, this acting balance between doing good quality research, maybe a little less, but good quality research, good teaching, and also serving the community, what we call in Italy the third mission. So we serve our communities, we give contribution to society and to the scholarly field. A, a better balance, I think, will bring necessarily to less of those, um, let's say, salami papers, less of those um, extremely uh, long list of authors in papers, less of those unethical practices. Uh, which I think in general uh, each other must be in a paper when contributes significantly to the development of the paper in some way and many journals are stressing this issue now but I think it's also good for the young scholars to remember that maybe sometimes one good paper will make them stand out of the crowd much more than 10 little papers, let's say, use the word little. Yep. <laughs> and therefore, it yep. is extremely important to uh, 
to think about this balancing of the portfolio and it's not only important for personal reasons it is important for society because the higher the performances that our universities expect from us in terms of quantity the more the risk is that each decade the new generation is going to increase these numbers but not necessarily increase the quality of research. Okay. All right. So I that would be a suggestion mm. yeah. <laughs> to no, the no, younger. Think... Yeah, yeah, maybe I, when I, we, I... Perry, when we get more mature, we have a little more time to do quality <laughs> research, to detect <laughs> things slowly. Yes, that's, of course, that's part of life. But the COVID has taught also us uh, a new lesson, right? We can maybe 12 COVID papers in one year. My question is, what's, what's going to be in 10 years from now, how many of those papers will actually have had a scientific or even a knowledge, as Gabby called it, impact? Yeah, yeah. No, that's a good point. I, uh, and I think there's, a, there's an interesting question here whether this focus that was raised earlier on the, on the number of... Uh, uh, papers that the people are publishing is it, is it if we become a numbers game we're just cranking out publishing for the sake of publishing does anyone must read them or are we in an echo chamber we're just reading our own stuff to publish more to publish more to uh, and and not engaging which was put out here earlier with the community with the industry i mean we are an applied <coughs> related field we're not a purely theoretical field which which, which some some areas would argue and, and, and make a different point so I, I guess there is that really interesting uh, connectivity there. And I think, you know, universities are part of the society. And we've also got to remember that. And what role uh, is society expecting us to play? And universities have changed. Um, in, in most uh, societies, originally when universities started, they were more seen as religious institutions. It was, it was more purely from that. And we, over time, uh, that, those have been significant changes. Uh, whatever period you, you look, uh, obviously, uh, we'll, we'll give the University of Bologna, which is often mentioned in European context, as the first university in Europe there. But if we go back to India, I believe, no, I, I think it was uh, Nalanda University, was, if we go back uh, even further in history and time. So there's quite an interesting sort of concept to think about the role that we play and therefore the role our research has in, in, in all that. Now, let me look back to Joseph because one of the issues you wanted to raise here is we've, we've got, had this tricky issue here about being a reviewer, uh, the purpose of reviewing, the purpose of journals. And I think one of the, the challenges is, is how to become an effective and a good reviewer. So over to you, Joseph. Right. Um, I think I'm just as bad as Demetrios because I thought I was talking about desk rejection. Um, oh. Nevertheless, in order to be a good reviewer, <laughs> you need to be able to, um, uh, to deftly handle papers that uh, are going to be rejected. So if you don't mind, Perry, I, let me first talk about desk rejection because it's a, it's a pertinent topic, right? And it is, I, and it, on, we've got, yeah, we've got that coming up later, but, but yeah. far away on that one. Okay. We'll, and I'll get we'll on to that the reviewer. But if anyone else is going to cover that topic later, I can, I can forego that. Desk rejection. Right, I, I thought I'd mention this, and I'd, I'd like to echo Dimitrios's point about, uh, uh, firstly, about researchers. We spend a lot of time doing the research and writing the paper, less time on promoting the work. And, and I did this, uh, some, um, a very informal analysis with people, and it's staggering that people think when you do the research and you publish the paper, that's the end of things. That's not the end of things, right? Nevertheless, let me get on to desk rejection. Mm -hmm. the, the, the homily I, I always, I always uh, say to uh, especially early career researchers is that you don't get a second chance to make a good first impression. You know, and as editors, our time is precious and we often have to expedite things, right? And I always say that, um, you know, we, we often get emails, informal emails. Can you have a look at this um, <laughs> paper? And imagine if we did that for every person that emailed us, we wouldn't have any time to do our jobs. But nevertheless, so you don't get a good, chance, a good second chance to make a good first impression. I always say to authors, imagine you have this um, credibility account starting at 100 whatever the currency is. Let's say $100. And as the editor goes line by line through your paper, you start losing money along the way, right? So okay. it's especially important for researchers to think in that way because every line, every word, um, authors, authors need to be judicious about what they're doing. Read, reread, edited, re 
re-edit. So editors have to make expeditious decisions. We can't spend hours of time poring over a paper, looking at it four or five times before we make a decision to reject it. And editors have honed the skill of rapidly assessing the merits of the paper. Um, and I know, I, if I look at an abstract, and it's a, what we call in Australia an absolute dog's dinner, in other words, it's all over the place, um, you've already lost your 100 credit points. And, and uh, you know, if you can't write an abstract thoroughly, then you, 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 it's a slippery slope. Editors like to give authors the benefit of the doubt. Editors don't sit in a dark room, you know, with the, um, you know, with the hood over their head <laughs> saying, now, who can I reject today? We would like to give all authors the benefit of the doubt where we can. But the onus is on the authors to ensure that the paper is prepared meticulously, um, because otherwise uh, we, have no, we have no choice in the decision. And it makes me think of uh, what Sarah Dolnikar says. We communicate in Twitter a lot. And she lamented that her paper got rejected in annals. The, the journal she's the editor of, right? <laughs> so, you know, no one escapes. I'll be I'll be dark dark. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I don't even have to ask her, but no one escapes scrutiny. So the, the, the onus is on people to ensure that their papers are meticulously presented uh, to avoid desk rejection. But desk rejection is what we have to get used to. Serena's topic, publish and perish, is a third part to that, publish, perish, and learn to deal with rejection because we all have to do, deal with rejection at some point. Stan has a 90% rejection rate, right? So uh, you can see that the competition to, to, to elevate yourself is tough. So prepare your paper meticulously. I don't know if I have time to go through the question you no, asked. No, 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 no. I think that's a really good point because we'll come with, um, in the other round, I know, I think that, that was actually a question for Stan, but I think it's really important one because, you know, with, uh, as you mentioned, we are rejecting so many papers. And I think the other key point of that is how do you make sure you're submitting to the right journal? Because obviously desk rejection takes up a lot of people's time. And so this request, this, this comes down to how do I correctly select a journal to send it to? And, and obviously I think there's fatal flaws. I, I, we get many papers and I just say, look, wrong journal. It's called the Journal of Vacation Marketing. Why do you send me a paper on human resource management? You know, <laughs> you know the name kind of gives it away. So even some basic stuff like that often gets, uh, gets missed. So no, do hold up one because I think this is a really important point for the audience and for many academics seem to overlook uh, I often wonder if sometimes journal selection is a bit like, you know, pin the tail on the donkey. People do it blindfold. And we, do, you know, I would encourage people because it, it, it is a bad uh, use of people's time, if I can put it, be, be so blunt on that. Now, before I move into, into the next round of questions, I'm just going to add my little pressing topic, which is the issue of um, journals, which unfortunately we're now seeing with this growth, which we've talked about, with the move online, which we've talked about, we're also seeing a huge increase in the number of predatory and fake journals. And this, is, I think, is a particularly worrying issue. Now, obviously, open, um, uh, open access opened the door to not only, I mean, there's many very good open access journals, but what it also opened the door to was a, a number of publishers who are basically making money and will publish anything that they get sent. Now, even The Economist magazine weighed in on this last year, pointing out and showing some very interesting charts about the number of predatory journals. We're also seeing the insidious of a fake journal. So the journal sounds like the journal you know, but they've changed one word. So it doesn't become anymore the journal, uh, Stan's Journal of the European Journal of Tourism Research. It comes to European Research Journal of Tourism. One word changes and it's a different journal. We've had with Sage uh, other times when they've actually created fake websites. So it's a real journal, but the website has been faked. And we had situations where people had actually been asked and paid money to have their paper published, but it was a completely fake website that had been set up. So we have to be very careful. And there's also what we call mirror journals, who are journals that mirror a real journal as well. And actually, uh, I often give a presentation where I show three journals. Each journal has exactly the same name. One is real, two are fake. And people can't pick it. So you have to be very, very careful. And unfortunately, there's something that's gone on. And sad to say, India has been at the forefront of being able to do this. And there's a certain uh, business over in Hyderabad, which recently was fined by the US government, uh, 14 million, I think, US dollars, if I recall, uh, for these activities. So these are challenging issues. Uh, and of course, I'm not just saying that it's, it's something that's come out particularly from India, but there's a number of different countries. 
uh, where people are now seeing publishing as a way uh, to make extraordinary profits from this. And I think, you know, as an academic community, this is something we have to be worried about and concerned about. So that's my, uh, that's my pressing issue. Now, on to the various rounds of questions that we've got. So I'm going to start off with Serena here. And the question we've got here was, um, how do I go about identifying research topics that are going to help me stand a better chance of getting published? Have you got any advice or thoughts on that, Serena? Hey, thanks, Barry. That's um, actually a very interesting question that uh, we all go through, um, I guess, uh, and particularly the younger uh, scholars. Uh, my um, first take on it is that we ought to be current, we ought to, be st to stay current. And to do that, uh, there are maybe a few things that we can do. Uh, scholars could uh, uh, read from the mainstream field. So if uh, I am a marketing, uh, tourist marketing um, scholar, I can go back to the mainstream marketing literature and dig into what it's current there, what changes are happening. If I am a psychology uh, oriented scholar, I go back to the mainstream psychology literature and so on. And that would be basic, okay. But there are a few things that we can do more than that. We can talk to the stakeholders. We can talk to the tourists. We can, in normal, in a normal, uh, normal times, we can go out there in the industry and engage with the people who actually have the real problems in the field of hospitality and tourism. And by by discussing with them, by collaborating, by um, opening up to new research collaborations, we might find good ideas. So, so let's say broaden our scope and to find good topics for research. So stay current in the sense of academic literature, stay current in the sense of uh, keeping your uh, senses open to what's happening in the industry and to the tourist um, interest. One other thing is certainly uh, uh, sometimes to collaborate uh, with people within your country and I go back to maybe also our, our uh, Indian colleagues, but also collaborate with people outside your country and outside of your research group that sometimes uh, uh, even just start and ideas uh, out of the box, out of the use. You have to think a little bit outside of the box. So these are a few suggestions questions that I can uh, give and I always think it is better to invest time at the beginning of the research process to find an interesting topic than have to re-change it after the first round of reviewers because the reviewers are not happy with the, the focus of your topic or your paper. So invest more at the beginning to find interesting ideas and then we'll make your journey smooth better. Okay, that's a good point. Well, thank you for that. And now let's take, take that Metin, if I might, over to your point, because one of the other questions we got asked here has been, how do I write up my rationale? So obviously I've got to pick a topic and find it, you know, to, to make it feel appealing to an editor. Because it, it, a lot of papers I get, it's just about identifying gaps in, 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 the, in the literature. Is that it? Is it got to be more than that? Nathan, what are your thoughts on that? Thank you, Perry. Well, I think that the writing the rational part of any paper is uh, I think the main reason of, you know, either accepting paper for, for, for a peer review or mm -hmm. for a desk rejection, either by the you know, editors or by the reviewers. So I think writing this uh, part, uh, the rational part is, is very important when we design uh, a paper, okay, for a submission to a, a good quality journal. I think we may think about two issues for this part. One is, okay, what, how this paper can be, you know, uh, important to, to fill in the gap in the literature, okay? And this is, I think, what the, the majority of journal or journal editors is looking for. They always ask us, as the authors, how do you fill in the gap? Or if there is a gap first, and then how you can fill in this gap? Well, sometimes I disagree with the idea, but it happens. The second, I think uh, we don't always have to fill in the gap 
sometimes we can also you know create a gap ourselves. Right. Okay, and this can also help you know the academia, the society to to develop new theories for the future. The third one, I think, we can test the findings of you know earlier empirical studies or either theories. Okay, and this can also, I think, for myself, you know, uh, a contribution to the field. Right. Okay, well, that's a really good points there, because I think one of the big challenges is, is justifying why people are doing the paper. And I find, as an editor, you know, going back to the earlier point Joseph made about, as an editor, I look at what is it this paper's going to do? And if you can't justify that, to give a rationale about why I should spend my time or anyone else who want to read it, there's got to be a clear rationale underlying the purpose of this research and, and that background. Now that leads us into the next challenge. Stands up is, is the question Perry, about before the you go, review. Yeah, sure. Perry, be, be, before yeah. you go, I just um, when you, when I get a paper into this review, I'm just going through very quickly, and I'm kind of trying to understand the motivations of the authors. Mm -hmm. And sometimes mm -hmm. I hear, "I need a promotion." I need a pay rise. <laughs> My boss told me to do this. And I've done, you know, Serena talked about the salami publishing. <laughs> I've published five papers on this topic. And if you manage to get the sixth one, I'll be winning. And desk rejection is coming uh, very quickly, 65% <laughs> in tourism review. Um, and, and, but sometimes you get these papers that they are, people are really passionate about what they're doing and they're absolutely engaging in what they're doing. And, and they're bringing, you know, they, they bring their best self in there. And the other thing I really, really hate is when I get a paper and has got spelling mistakes on the title and, you know, you just start reading the abstract like Joseph was saying and, you know, six line down, the, you kind of say, okay, okay, uh, you really yeah. need someone to help you. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a really, it's a really good point too. And, and I completely agree with you, the number of papers we've had in that I've seen where I feel it's not, it's a promotion. The person, the author might have well have written is, I found this data lying around after I did another study and I'm not quite sure what to do with it. So I've written it up and this is the paper. And you go, that's not a rationale for a paper, just because you have to have some more data lying around from a leftover survey. But that's kind of what you get. So uh, I think having, having said that, Perry, uh, mm -hmm. as university senior administrators, and you know, many of us have had positions like that. I also get pay, I get emails from people say, can you accept my pay by, by Monday, please? Because I'm going to oh, lose yes. my job if I don't have that. And I think it's a responsibility from the university and, and the administrators to actually support the young researchers to understand what it's all about. And, you know, uh, accept my paper by Monday. Can I have it printed? Can you give me a certificate? And, and can I have it with the, um, you know, with page numbers? Uh, it's not gonna help anybody, but, but we really need, we, we are doing it. And people have done it to us and we've tolerated for many years and all the rest of it. Um, but, but this is something that universities have, have got to learn, especially from some countries. Let me, let me mention, because this is a real, a real story from Korea. I'm gonna lose South Korea. I'm gonna lose my job if I don't get my paper accepted by Monday. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I've had similar kind of things and again, the problem I see with that is that then opens the door to a lot of the fake predatory type of journals because they'll turn yep. around and do it if they got cash. And so what would the universities by, by not understanding the rest of the system and tr pushing people like that creates these shortcuts so we become our own worst enemy. And I think that's a very dangerous situation we've put ourselves in there. So th thanks, thank you for those additional points there, uh, Dimitris. Now, when we go into that standard, one of the issues then is developing up the the literature review. So people have got a good rationale for why they're doing it. Now they move into the literature review. And uh, so one of the often reasons the papers fail is they haven't done a strong enough. And another comment I often get is, well, your literature review is not up to date enough. And in fact, I got have one the other day, so it wasn't actually quoting any papers from 2021. Well, given the fact we were only in the first, the end of the first month of the year, I thought that was a bit much, but anyway, these are some of the things that comments I'm, I'm, I'm seeing. So any thoughts there from you? Yeah, uh, the literature review is a very important part of uh, the paper. So I would uh, give the following recommendations. 
first, uh, the literature review must have some uh, logical structure. So it needs to have a structure. Because if we have, uh, let's say, uh, 2,000, 3,000 word literature review for a full paper, which is uh, uh, just a monolithic text, it will be very difficult for the, for the, uh, for the editor and the reviewers to read, uh, let alone the, uh, the, um, uh, the other readers. So it's good to structure the literature review in several sections, two, three, four, depending on, how, uh, uh, depending on the topic, and um, so uh, this will uh, and uh, this will make the literature review first more readable. Also, uh, the literature review needs to be logical, relevant, and focused. So, if we write about a particular topic, uh, then the literature review needs to needs to be connected to that topic. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, because uh, um, sometimes I've seen literature reviews, so for example, about uh, especially last year about COVID nineteen. Uh, that uh, repeat only what is uh, COVID-19 and uh, what happened and how bad it is. So we know this. So what, what is uh, the, the literature review is not quite relevant to, uh, to the topic. Also, it needs to be connected to the aim and objectives. So what we, uh, um, so what we, uh, um, what we define as uh, objectives in the, in, uh, in the introduction, then we'll determine to some extent the structure and the content of uh, the literature review, what we need to look at from a theoretical perspective. Also, the sources need to be recent. I uh, usually, I recommend to, uh, to my students uh, for their dissertations to have something like 60, 80% of the, their references coming for the last five years, but for research papers, uh, this is even this is even more important. This does not mean that we need to cite uh, every single paper published in 2021, including those that are still under review, mm -hmm. but uh, or, or that we should not cite uh, papers published 50 years ago. But uh, these papers should uh, not uh, dominate. Um, also, um, uh, because the language the language of science is English. I would love if the language of science, of scientific communication was Bulgarian, but unfortunately it's not, it's English. So we have to get, we have to accept this fact. Uh, probably more than 85, 90% of all academic pub scientific publication is, is in English. This means that uh, the literature review should be based on international sources published in English language. Of course, local publications, they, they are very rare, they might be very relevant, they need to be cited as well, that's, uh, that's very important. But uh, to make, but uh, to submit a paper to a tourism review, which is entirely based on reviewing publications uh, in Bulgarian journals, I'm pretty sure that Dimitrios will smile and will say, sorry, desk rejected. <laughs> also, uh, three other uh, uh, comments, uh, which, I, uh, 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 which I think that uh, they, uh, they would improve uh, the literature review a figure with the links between the concepts, something like a, uh, uh, that shows the links the, of the different concepts, something that Dimitrios likes a lot for the, for the encyclopedia. And by the way, he returned one of my entry because he wanted a figure there. Thank you. <laughs> but now it looks much, much better. So, uh, so a figure, we always a figure is to worth please a thousand me. words. <laughs> it's much better to, to have a figure showing the relationships between the concepts. Sometimes, instead of a figure, you may put a table, a summary table with the characteristics and the findings of key publications. So instead of explaining in thousand words who wrote what, okay. etc., just summarize this in a table, refer to the table, and write 300 words with the most important uh, findings. And of course, something that we always say, this is critical evaluation. It's not who said what only, but it is uh, so what. Uh, so, uh, what conclusions can we make from these publications? What are they? Uh, what is the theoretical contribution? So, what is um, what is the link between them? Uh, between them? So, uh, dealing with critical evaluation, not just simple summary of uh, of, uh, of the publications. Yep. Uh, so, some really good points there, and I think the, I, I noticed that from different countries, and I think you made two good points there. One is the the challenge, and uh, you know, I feel very I was just, you know, accident of birth. I happened to be born. So in England, when English is my mother tongue, so I haven't had to deal with Bulgarian, Greek, Turkish, Italian, which you've got on the panel here today to, to, to deal with that. So uh, uh, that was pure luck there. I think the other point there that is very relevant about this issue about how to present that information and tables, there are other ways of doing that. 
One of the things I've noticed about papers I've received, particularly from India, has been that the amount of literature review take team seems to take up a greater percentage of the paper than other countries where the literature is very, very short and they'll spend much more time explaining the methodology. Or if I get a paper from France, sorry, the philosophy, they want to really give you the philosophy because that's a much deeper cultural point they want to get across. Whereas other papers will put more on the, the finding section or dare I say the conclusion. So it's the challenge of getting that balance right. And um, so these are some observations I've seen over different papers and I see that there are cultural and and presumably differences from, 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 from emanating from that and from the education systems in different countries. Now let's moving on from that. Sam, thank you so much for those, for those comments because one of the, the other questions we got posed with is when it comes to methodology, should I take a qualitative or quantitative approach? What is more likely to get me published? So Gabby, what are your thoughts on that? And should people try novel approaches? Because I know you've done quite a bit of experimental. I was listening to your colleague, Sarah Dolikat, speaking at the conference at the opening keynote yesterday. And, and she was making reference to the sort of experiential work that you're doing and so forth. Now, is that a risk as a researcher to do that? Or should I play it safe? What's your thoughts on that? Absolutely not. And, and the first question around, uh, should I do a qualitative and a quanti or quantitative research? That very much depends on, on what you're looking at and how much research has already been established and how new and novel your research is. Because um, the decision to, to do a qualitative study or a quantitative study shouldn't be determined by the preference of the journal. And I would safely say that most journals these days don't have preferences. In the days of, oh, if you go for this journal, they like qualitative work or this journal's more empirical quantitative work are gone. And I think um, it, it depends on the study and how much information is out there and whether you're taking a deductive approach or an inductive approach to your study. Um, we crave novel methods. I get excited. <laughs> I do a lot of the desk considerations for JVM and when I get a, a paper in that's used lab methods such as eye tracking technology or um, physiological measurement of emotion or um, virtual reality, I get really excited and I encourage you if you, if you have access to such equipment to explore these methods because um, Technology is moving very quickly, particularly in the research methodology space. And I think the more we can learn about these methods in tourism, I mean, they've been around in the marketing discipline, psychology discipline for, for years now. But the more we can um, bring these over to tourism, the, the, the richer we'll be able to, um, the deeper we'll be able to explore the tourist behaviour. And, you know, the days of self-report emotions are, are long gone. And um, I think... Yeah, there is, it's not a matter of should I do a qual or a quant paper, it's a matter of what your research problem is telling you to do. And there is no risk in being novel in your methods as long as the methods have been done well and your methodology section is tight and explains everything um, that you've done in, in terms of bringing your research to fruition. All right, well, thank, thanks for that because I think some people have, have you know, be worried that some journals won't focus on, on or, or be willing to take that. And then another challenge, of course, for some journals has been finding the reviewers as well, particularly when you go down not novel things. And I, I, I fear that's inhibited uh, us from, and, and from people from trying things uh, in terms of going forward. So, but Demetrius, let me just circle back to you. One of the points we were just discussing there is the balance within a paper. And so one of the questions we've had here is, how much balance should there be in when it comes to the discussion? Now, given the comment I made about how there seems to be different countries which have got slightly different views of, of, of how that should be put together in a paper coming from different forms of discourse, this is a very broad question about how much discussion there should be in a paper. But when you're looking at papers and research, what's your sort of feeling on, on, on how this balance should be? We are looking for meaningful papers that they say, look, this is the, what the literature is saying and the literature is up to date. Then we're looking to, we did, we identified this gap, we did this research and back to your qualitative or quantitative. I prefer mixed methods actually, where the people are bringing different kinds of uh, research designs together. 
and then it means that in terms of the discussion and then the implications in the industry. Um, I think I think the, the papers need to be balanced, and I, I encourage people to actually read the tourism review before they submit to tourism review. Right. And, and it's quite funny, you know, sometimes you're going through the reference and there's not a single paper from Tourism Review. They've never read the journal and, and they would like to publish in the journal. How can that happen? So <laughs> it's really about look into, look into what kind of papers we are publishing. Look how the balance is, 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 is coming together. And it's not that, that difficult, really. Uh, it needs to be meaningful. It needs to be... It needs to add uh, value and needs to have an impact to society. So if you are spending all, the, all your time giving me mathematical formulas, go to a journal of mathematics. You don't come to a journal of, of, of tourism. Yeah. That's my Because I, I think it's a good point you made there. I, mean, I see some papers that we get that come in. These are my you know, literature review. Here's my study. Here are my findings. And then literally, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Job done. Yeah. And there's, there's, there's no, uh, you know, discussion. There's no how would this, what the contribution is. That sort of gets missing. And I often find that's another reason people... I think the most rejected. important thing, Perry, is someone who would like to publish in a journal, read from that journal before yes, that's a really good point. they put, they put the, the paper together. And, and actually, I've got a cheeky question to ask you, which I've changed my mind recently. And I think a lot of people will find that useful. Do you use an academic uh, academic editor to help you develop your script? And I changed mm -hmm. recently my view on this because I, and now I said I suggest and uh, particular people who used to be academics, one of them used to be at the University of Queensland, uh, Donna, who is doing a fantastic job uh, uh, helping authors to bring people people out. Uh, rather than one of these kind of places where you're sending your paper, and they check your English, uh, they charge you $200 and they come back. Someone who can actually help you develop the paper academically, because I recognize that a lot of people from different countries that have never actually worked in this kind of system, they'll never progress to the next level until they've got the support and you know Joseph said earlier how long do you think an editor can look into it into a paper and how long do you think we can spend on a paper uh trying to suggest things I can I certainly cannot edit every single paper again no, uh, we no. get 620 papers per year and I think that is something I don't know if other editors are using uh uh, uh, uh colleagues for uh academic and uh editing but I think this is a money worth uh spending and working with the right people, I think that's the critical thing. Working with the right people to actually develop your ideas in a format that can be published. Because we really like to publish good ideas, but if they are not at the right format, you're going to get yeah. desk rejected or you're going to get rejected again. No, and I think that's a that's a very good point. Uh, obviously, dare I say, people who lack English is their first language, and they've they've also come through a particular education system. It does give them a. a, a possible advantage and papers I tend to see is the question about how do we get voices from other parts of the world from other experiences to come up in the journals and and so you know it's quite clear when we look across the journals that there's many countries which I've never ever had a paper from uh you know I I maybe threw a paper not long ago from Albania because we never had a paper from Albania before and I really felt it was important that we started to show uh, to, to have something I thought was an interesting concept as well for that particular thing but you're right Demetrius it was a lot of uh, work and effort that those things take uh, and I think there's you know other sources of way of uh, helping uh, academics and for academics to realize that uh, they, they need certain support. I mean, we're not all good at all things, let's face it, in terms of writing, research, etc., uh, and to what we can do to support those. Now, I think it's a very good point. Uh, Joseph, just to go on to one of the things about data, one of the questions that often comes up is, how old can my data be? And, you know, at what point uh, is that, you know, that it's not something I'm willing to accept? So is it one year, two years, five years, 10 years? Uh, at what point? Now, obviously, different journals and different disciplines got different views on this. Obviously, if we're a history journal, it'd be a very different view. But what 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 sort of things are we looking at here? And what's what's your sort of feeling on that? Right. Um, thanks, Perry. I'll keep this very brief because I um uh, I sense that we could talk about this for a while. 
So um, what I'd like to do, I, I guess it's, it, it, it may seem like a lame response, but I always say it depends, right? As, as you say, it depends on the journal, depends on the editor, depends on the, the, the subject matter of the paper. But let me answer that question according to the two various methods. Mm -hmm. When is primary data too late to publish? Just in case those of you, some of you watching are, are, are not able to distinguish between what primary data is and what secondary data is. Secondary data is data that's already available, you know, government data, that kind of thing. Primary data is what we go out to do as researchers, the, 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 I guess the unique contribution to knowledge we make through our own studies. So when it comes to when is data too late to publish, let me start with quantitative and I'll keep this very brief. The question that, that researchers need to ask themselves is, is there data long run or is it short run? You know, at the moment we're getting COVID papers where people are making equivocal pronouncements about what, what the last 12 months is bringing us and what the future will look like, right? Yeah. That gives us an idea that that short run data can't possibly make these equivocal judgments over a period of time. And researchers need to ask themselves, is this data snapshot or, or does it provide a trend? When we say snapshot, one year provides a snapshot, 10 years provide a time series analysis. And for us to make a decent contribution to the discussion, time series analysis is what editors tend to yeah. prefer because it shows a definitive trend over a time. When it comes to qualitative, this I, I tend to think the qualitative data usually stands the test of time beta, better. As you said, historical data, right? If, we, if we're looking backwards, <laughs> you know, that rarely changes. You know, ethnography and autoethnography has become quite, quite a sexy topic for, for researchers to, to use. And very often they use it as a, as a kind of vehicle to get the paper accepted. But qualitative data requires a depth. And very often without that depth, it doesn't matter uh, whether uh, I, don't know if it's just me. Not... I think Joseph is frozen. Oh, can you? Yeah. I can... yeah, I'm back. Um, uh, I'm not sure where I stopped off, but but um, qualitative data usually stands, stands the test of time better. You know, if we think about ethnography or social and cultural impact or attitudes and behaviors, a lot of times we are looking to what's happened, right? So, I think the big thing we need to understand is. Um, long run versus short run and relevance of the, of, of the, the data. This is why Dimitrios probably rejects a lot of papers on COVID-19 because you can't possibly uh, chart long-term trends when COVID-19 is actually still in, in play. Uh, and when we talk are, about yeah. the impact soft. Impact. Yeah. yeah. Now these are some really good points because I think this is challenging uh, about how fast or how long you can sit on data. Uh, and obviously it, it takes time if you've done a very big survey to, to work out different parts of it. So I think these, these are really pressing sort of issues. But Serene, I'm going to circle back to you now because we've heard already one of the frustrations from editors is, you know, this whole issue of that desk rejects and so forth. We can come back to that again in a moment. But one of the issues that keeps coming up and Demetrius said again, you know, don't submit to a journal you've never read. <laughs> I think, which is a bit of a golden rule. And one of the clear one, so one of the questions I ask you is, what sort of steps do you think someone should go through to find the right journal to submit their manuscript to? Thank you, Barry. Uh, very interesting question. And, um, you know, I, I think the most um, problematic issue with the question is, how do we define right? What is a right journal? Okay, so I take this, uh, I make my <laughs> definition <laughs> for this audience, and the definition is that it should write for the audience of the journal, for those scholars and those industry stakeholders who are going to read the journal. Um, so therefore, in this perspective, let's say uh, one of the major things to do, the first things to do is to get familiar with the journal. It's about reading and understanding the focus, the aim and the scope of the journal, sure. It's also understanding the geographical scope, for example, we have the case mm -hmm. of the European journal. It's about understanding the journal as a methodological approach that's preferred and it is true i am in agreement uh, with my colleagues there is usually all not accept uh, all different methodologies however there are some journals that are specialized so if i really got a very very good method paper i go to the journal of mixed method although this might be in tourism so these are things that we may want to consider 
then there are journals that really uh, bridge a lot more with the industry than others. So maybe if my paper has that in mind as an audience, that's where I should go. Journal of Vacation Marketing, I remember always being one of the leaders in this sense. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, another way to get familiar with the journal is uh, certainly read some articles. If you have not done so at the beginning of the process, at least do it at the moment you have to select the journal. But one other um, um, suggestion could be into getting familiar with the journal is to also browse the list of editorial board members and you know check what they have published. And if anyone in the board members as expertise has done some really uh, incredible research, uh, for example, on psych uh, psychophysiological measurements of emotions, like Gabby was saying before, then think about the linkage between your research and contribution to that journal in a different way, because you see that they the paper might actually be evaluated by somebody who's familiar with that topic. Mm. And this is a more, you know, journal related approach, but of course, going back to the issue of having to publish, as this is part of our job, it's for many, it's important for the career. One thing not to forget is to look into the lists of available journals, starting from the international rankings, moving down to the databases that we all know has been very influential. So those journals who have impact factor in the field of hospitality, tourism and leisure, and then moving down to your national rankings. In many countries, scholars are basically forced uh, in some way to publish within certain national rankings. So maybe that's really important also for the young scholars uh, everywhere in the world. And last but not least, even university level, we might have rankings that are even more precise in terms of what is required. So the right journal depends on whether you're looking into the audience side or you're looking also into your fulfillment of your duties, if not your career progression and so on. So that would be uh, some suggestions for the audience. Uh, well, thank you. Yeah, that was a very comprehensive and, and uh, th these are the challenges. So. As I said earlier, submitting to a journal is not a pin the tail on the donkey exercise. You really do need to think through, uh, you know, where the, the, the issues, as you mentioned, about the rankings and so forth. And I'll be honest, as an editor, this has even come as a surprise to us. I suddenly started getting a lot of papers from Spain and I couldn't work out why I'd suddenly become so popular in Spain. And it turned out the Spanish government had done a rankings of the journals and JDM had ended up in the highest category or whatever. And suddenly I'm getting, you know, tens of papers from Spain. Whereas in previous years, I'd hardly received any. So obviously that had affected where people were starting to submit their journals to. to. Uh, it would have been nice if the Spanish government had given me a heads up on what was going on, but that was suddenly what happened. And then the challenge as an editor was, do we have enough reviewers who understand the context that we're getting papers from in Spain? So these become the sort of challenges. Now, Metin, if I might turn to you, because before you were talking about this issue of a rationale. So now once I've, I've taken Serena's advice, I've selected the journal. Do I need to sell my paper to the editor? So how should I structure my letter of submission or the, the form when I, I put it in to generate interest in the editor for you to actually say, look, this paper could be something that's a good fit here. What, 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 what sort of gets your attention? And what sort of things, if I was a submitting author, should I think about saying? Well, thank you, uh, Perry. I think uh, uh, writing a paper is the difficult part of our, you know, uh, profession. And uh, once we have finished everything, you know, writing the paper, preparing tables, figures, and so on. And this is the, well, the tiny thing, but it is also important to write a letter to the editor. So uh, sometimes it's also boring for myself, but we have to do it, uh, you know, as an author, at least to convince, convince the editor saying that the paper is good to be published or at least to be, you know, sent out for the, for the review process. Yeah, 
So what we can do? Well, we can be more, we, we don't have to be more personal. So we can use a more professional language, explaining or you know, introducing our, the content of our uh, research by giving uh, some information about the purpose, methodology, okay? And how the study may be different from early studies, et cetera. So it shouldn't be too long, okay? So it, should, it shouldn't be too long to you know, write a sexy letter to Dimitrios, okay, to convince him <laughs> that my paper will be accepted by himself in the same day. So this is not possible. Uh, I know he likes you know, promotion, but you know, uh, this is also a good way of making the promotion for the paper, also for the, for the uh, journal. All right. Well, look, that's a, that's a really good point, Nathan. I see a lot of people, a lot of colleagues there smiling, laughing and nodding. So I'm going to ask a couple of the other editors if you'd like to jump into this point, because obviously this is a big issue, avoiding the desk reject, because a lot of people forget how many, what a huge percentage of papers do get desk rejected. And to come back to Serena's point, if you haven't selected the right journal to send your paper to, your chance of rejection are much higher. So I didn't know if anyone else, um, I, I can see Stan, you're kind of smiling there. And Gabby, I know you deal with a lot of the, de the, the desk thing. Have you, have you got any other thoughts on this? Um, if I can just chime in and say something really obvious, check the style and formatting guidelines and make sure that you have followed the specific guidelines for that particular paper, um, journal, because there's nothing more frustrating than receiving papers that are, as someone said earlier, I think it was you, Joseph, um, in my finest Australian slang, a dog's breakfast. <laughs> now, it, it, it's, I find it almost um, disrespectful in a way in that you haven't taken the time to simply follow the guidelines that are put there for a purpose before submitting your paper. And that's the quickest way to get your paper back. Now, sometimes we're kind and we say, please, if we see promise in the paper, we'll say, please format your paper in accordance with the journal guidelines. The other one is, what's your title length? Don't have a title that goes for four lines. Okay, so t really snappy and impactful title lengths because at the end of the day, you want people reading your papers and we want people to review your papers and having a poorly constructed title is a good way to get reviewers to decline our review requests yep. as well as not get, you not get yourself any citations. So that's yep. all, that's a bugbear of mine. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's a really good point. We've, we've had some, I, I've had some, seen some papers where the title was longer than the abstract, you know, it was quite incredible. And uh, really you've got to wonder what. So I think these are really good points to bear in mind when you're thinking about submitting. I mean, they seem obvious as Gabby just said, but it's amazing how many people don't follow them. Stan, you, you've got another comment you wanted to jump in with there. Yeah, uh, regarding the desk rejection, unfortunately, this is something that uh, the editors have to do, not because they love to see the suffering of the authors and uh, we, don't, we don't feed on uh, author suffering. But this is because <laughs> of uh, different reasons. Um, yeah, uh, people uh, papers may uh, maybe this papers may be this rejected first because uh, the paper is obviously outside of the scope of the journal. So I've received in DJTR papers related to engineering, to math, general philosophy, and when you open uh, when uh, when uh, when you start looking for the word tourism, it doesn't appear anywhere in the text. Obviously, it it goes beyond the scope. Also, DJTR is a regional journal, which means that uh, uh, empirical papers must have some European implications or, at least, or European focus. And uh, also, uh, yeah, uh, when the paper goes outside of the scope, it gets rejected. Or if there are too many studies on that topic, while we were talk, uh, uh, while we had the discussion, I just checked in our system uh, how many papers we, we received last year, 42 papers on COVID-19, only one was accepted. So everything wow. was uh, uh, was rejected. Uh, sorry, 35 were, desk re 35 were desk rejected. So we talk about 85% desk rejection on COVID-19 uh, papers. They, they all deal with the same thing. Or uh, with uh, lack of contribution to knowledge or descriptive nature of the paper or weak theoretical background or irrelevant methodology or very weak methodology, just presenting nice pie charts and nice tables uh, uh, doesn't mean that, uh, that the paper is uh, good enough. 
or uh, if there are discrepancies in explanations. I've seen papers where they write something in the abstract as uh, for, for, for example, what is their sample, uh, sorry, what is their research population, the sampling time, sample size, and you read after that in the method in the explanations in the methodology, completely different sampling type. And when you <laughs> ask the authors, why, uh, why is this uh, uh, difference? They say, we made a mistake. No, you don't make a mistake with your sample <laughs> size and your sample, it, this is not a mistake. It's a deliberate change. You can't have a mistake there. This is like uh, forgetting your own name. Uh, it is, uh, you can't do it. Or some unethical practices, like of course, plagiarism, data fabrications, but, uh, 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 or, for example, changing the wording of questions in a questionnaire after data were collected. So you have them in one language, they were translated, submitted to the, pay, uh, uh, to the journal, then the, uh, then the reviewer says something, okay, this is not, uh, 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 this scale is not what, uh, what you measure, then you receive uh, uh, different wording of the same questions. So obviously here you have unethical practice. Uh, of course, when you have small samples, uh, etc. Uh, I would consider these as uh, essential uh, um, uh, essential things. Uh, there are also some additional additional uh, reasons for rejection. These are things which you can fix by writing. Well, the previous one you can't fix, but these no. you can fix with writing. For example, additional explanations about the theoretical rationale, or uh, uh, there there need to be more explanations about the methodology, or the or this uh, lack of discussion or. Uh, theoretical managerial policy implications are, are not outlined, or um, the language is far from per perfect. I'm not a native speaker, so my English is probably at the level of B2, so I'm not even C1. Our son is C2, but uh, <laughs> uh, I'm not. I'm not. So, uh, um, so I'm not looking for something as... Uh, 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 and most of the submissions come from non-native speakers in DJ, yeah, yeah. DJTR, so we are not looking for perfect Shakespearean type of Queen's English written, but uh, at least uh, understandable. This can be changed uh, later on. And uh, something to uh, say as uh, uh, final, um, uh, if someone does not cite DJTR, this is not a reason for, for rejection in DJTR because um, there are many, uh, there are topics uh, which, uh, uh, which uh, uh, have not been published before that in DJTR. So they might not be papers that are relevant for that particular paper. So, um, yeah, I would love if uh, people cite the DJTR when they submit, but uh, uh, this is not uh, a criterion for disk rejection. Oh, that's great. I'm very glad to hear you say that as well, because I know yeah. some journalists have uh, been trying to get up their self, whatever. Um, but um, yes, uh, I, don't, don't worry, Senator, I, I, I'm not very good at Shakespearean or the Queen's English myself. Um, so uh, I probably because I left England so long ago. But anyway, th these are really good points I think you've made there. They're really excellent. And Gabby, I'm just going to turn to you because w as editors, we're very familiar with the processes. And you know, I think Stan, your point is very well made that in fact, the, you know, the challenge for editors is to desk reject. But what I'm hearing from you and from so many, actually, it's really self rejection, because what's happening is the paper rejects itself, because they haven't done the simple things, which we've asked people to do. And I know that sounds they may, may, maybe saying, I, I don't mean it to be insulting to people. But you know, we ask for fairly basic things, the formatting, you know, the way references are done, you know, what an abstract is. And if that isn't done, it's simply not going to get over that hurdle. So the, these may seem basic, but you're right. It's amazing how many papers don't uh, just, just, just meet with that. Now, I'm mindful of time. We've only got about 15 minutes to go. But Gabby, if I might just ask you just to run through, just so everybody, our audience, understand what the sort of process is. Uh, we've covered it up to getting the paper on, the, on, on, on your desk. What's the process just quickly so that everyone understands where what happens to papers. Because I think it's really important everyone's got a clear idea. Yeah, it, it is quite complex and, and there are various um, traps along the way where papers can get delayed. And I think everyone needs to understand that, but um, because it might feel like your paper's laying dormant and no one cares, but actually everyone's working really hard to make this process as smooth as possible. So, uh, obviously it comes in, it, it gets checked for formatting and it gets checked um, for conformity um, and 
we make sure sometimes people accidentally have their names on the paper, sometimes, which, which is a problem. So we have to send it back and ask you to remove the name. So we do those basic desk checks. And then um, that's done by, uh, generally done by Julie, who's our administration person. And then it'll come to myself um, and sometimes Perry. And we look at the, the content of the paper and, and we, we think about whether or not it it's worth sending out for review because the worst thing we can do as editors is waste reviewers time and send them papers that, that aren't really um, there, quite there yet. And, and reviewers can get quite cross about that and then they won't review for us anymore. So it's our job, we have a responsibility to make sure that we're sending out quality work to our reviewers. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for, for new contributions to knowledge. We're making sure that your paper's just not replicating what's already been done um, and so on. Then uh, it, it goes out to review. Now, sometimes this can take up to two weeks or, or longer to find, I wish I had some screenshots of, of some attempts to send out for review. And I'm sure all my fellow, to, fellow editors on the panel today would have similar screenshots where it could take um, nine, 10 invitations to actually get someone to say, yes, they'll review your paper. Some journals have three reviewers. Um, we have two, but that can take up to 10 attempts. And then these people have two weeks to make their decision as to whether they're going to say yes or no. So there, as you can understand, there's a bit of time lapse there. So they say, if they take two weeks and that's why if you get a review request and you can't do it, please respond straight away as soon as you get it. Because if it sits there for two weeks, that's time, dead time that's wasted. And so by the time we've gone through, you know, if, if six people have said no, that can be up to 12 weeks before we even find a reviewer. Then if we get a reviewer, it goes out to review and it comes back to us within 30 days, hopefully. Sometimes reviewers are a bit naughty and take a bit longer. Comes back to the editor for a decision. And this is generally a reject, uh, a minor revisions or a major revisions. Um, and so Perry usually deals with that part of it. Go back to you, you do the revisions, comes back in, it may go back to the reviewers, depending on how extensive the revisions were goes back, back to the reviewers, they then have 30 days, it, send it back and so on. And then it's an accept or reject, which is that decision's made by the editor, um, pending on what the reviewers have said about your paper and, and their reviews. And then of course, it's over to our desktop publishers, which is the journal administrators to help you um, polish off your paper for publication. That's right. And so each journal will go through a fairly similar process. And may I add, just as we're doing this conference in India, Sage actually has its publication centre in India. So all our papers actually end up in India at this point, by the way. So look, there is, it's a global, it's a global. Uh, Gabby and Julia are based in Australia. I'm based in Malaysia. Our publication office is in London and our, where the actual publishing happens and the editorial side of it is in India. It's a global production. So, you know, when people see, a, see the journals, often they forget just how much is behind all this. Now, as you're picking up, you know, you pick up, it takes quite a bit of time. Joseph, if I just turn to you, Gabby, get a little bit of indication about how long these things take. For your journal, and we can't deal with everyone today, but just, just sort of what, what sort of delays and, and how long do you see these things taking? Because as, as, as Gabby's mentioned, there are various hiccups. We, we can't make people review a paper. As much as we'd like to put people into an arm lock and bounce on top of them, get them to do it. I'm sure you've got a couple of sumo wrestlers in Japan who you'd like to, dis to dispatch at some times to get papers reviewed. We can't make people do that. So what, 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 your, what, what are you finding as an editor? Yep, right. Um, thanks, Perry. Thanks. Uh, and I, I think Gabby's covered some of the, 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 the essential bits. But the bottlenecks, uh, as Gabby said, include um, editor backlogs. You know, sometimes there are seasons, right? When people are on holidays... Just after the holidays, you will get a deluge of papers. So try not to try to avoid. It's like driving in peak traffic, right? Try to avoid those those peak submission times. Um, they generally follow holidays. Um, as Gabby said, the reviewer responses, author responses are part of the the, the backlog, but and the uh, and the publisher back office processes. For us in tourism geographies, um, the editor will often desk reject it within one to four days, um, and if not, we get we get lots of emails reminding us to do that. Um, and in terms of finding reviewers, two weeks, six weeks, in terms of reviewing the papers. So this can balloon up. And authors don't understand. All authors understandably want their papers 
uh, reviewed very quickly and, and published very quickly. There are some journals that do that. There are some that charge article processing fees. Some of you will know them, right? Where they are onto you within three days and five days of you of the reviewer and you don't do it. So um, it varies with journals, but the, 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 the bottom line is if the paper's well-crafted, well-edited, it will, it will, it will uh, sail through the process relatively quickly. Um, so it depends. Uh, we're not as quick as Demetrios, but I would say two to three months is a really good timeline for authors to expect to get to the, the back end of the process. Right. Okay, then. So that's, that's uh, now just going to Demetrius, because I've got another question to you there, but you've taken just as a bit of comp you know, contrast here, you've, you've, I know, tried to push very hard on, on a, a faster turnaround on, on that. And, you know, that, that presumably presents you with some challenges too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I've got into situations where I get a, a review of one of my papers that I've forgotten I've written. <laughs> because it's coming back, you know, in five, six, seven months. And I said, what? When did I write this paper? Never mind about reviewing. So um, many of you who have actually submitted in Tourism Review, you know that you get almost an instant reaction, whether it's going forward or not. And I think, I think, uh, I think authors appreciate that because if I desk reject the paper, they can go somewhere else or they can see why this desk reject the paper in proven resubmitted review. And I think, I think the role of the editor is to accept very good papers. And we are here not to reject, but we are here to accept very good papers. And I think the role of the, of the author is not to get rejected. I think it's really important because some of my PhD students are coming along and say, I really want to, my paper to get accepted. I said, no, you don't understand the game. What we're trying to do is not to get rejected. Okay. So for all the reasons that Gabi said, you know, don't give the opportunity to the editor to reject your paper. And let me, let me take you through some of the numbers of, of tourism review. 65% of the papers who arrive on my desk they are desk rejected within three days. I have a look very quickly. I do all the desk rejections myself, so I know that they're consistent and fair and all the rest of it. 65% uh, are desk rejected. Then what's happening is that the rest, 35% uh, are going for review. 20% are getting rejected on R1. So when the reviewers are coming back and say, I don't like that, I don't like that, I don't like that, then you have desk rejection for 20%. Now, something we haven't talked about is that the reviewers are actually consultants to the editors. Sometimes the editors may disagree with the reviewers and ultimately the decision and the responsibility lies with the editor. So 65 plus 20 gives us 85% of the papers that are coming to tourism review they are rejected within the first 40 days. So that leaves me with 15% of the papers that have been sub submitted to work with. Remember, I still need about 80 papers per year. I get six, 620 last year. So I've got to filter, I've got to filter, I've got to filter. So out of this 15%, they'll probably go into three rounds or four rounds, the maximum we've got is seven rounds of, of, of revisions. And there is the responsibility of the author to work with uh, the reviewers and the editor to improve the paper. I had situations where author said, how dare the reviewer um, telling these things about my paper? I know best. It doesn't take you anywhere, right? Uh, and I had I had a situation. I mean, so so what happens is that if the authors at R1 they're going to the next stage, they look very carefully on what the reviewers are saying. They're creating a very nice table and says, yes, I understand that. This is what they've done. No, I don't agree with that because of this and this and these reasons, and therefore I'm doing this. So all of those things reduce the time of the decision, both for the reviewers, both for the editors. So what's happening is that then this 15% is going around a couple of times and I reject another 3% in, 
in R2 or on R3 are trying not to do that. Um, and then 12% is getting accepted. So this is the numbers for tourism review. All right, well, I thank you for sharing critical, this, yeah. I think it's very critical for people to understand that, you know, you don't really want to lock a paper in for a year and a half because by that time you, you lose the, the will to leave. And also <laughs> science has moved and you have missed the promotion and you have missed everything. And, and you know, there's more things that they can wait for, for a year and a half, unless you're doing a, I don't know. Um, yeah. And especially because I'm coming from technology, a year and a half, it's kind of a century in our, in our kind of area. Yeah. So, so I, I think, well, your, role good... is, your role is not to get yeah. rejected. And my role is to accept the good papers. Right. And I think you said that very well. I think these are the challenges. And to see papers go around, and I mean, I think uh, I, I'm seeing papers go through more rounds of revision than they were in the past, I think, uh, you know, but, you know, the challenge also is, as you, as you mentioned, there's some reviewers get their heels really dug into a particular issue. And as editor, you know, our challenge is we find ourselves in a, in a Mexican standoff between reviewers and, 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 uh, and authors. And so, you know, some people don't appreciate the role as editors and the, the many facets that we've got in all that. Now, look, Gentlemen and ladies, I'm very conscious of time for the conference. Uh, they've got the next session starting in 15 minutes. We actually had four rounds of questions and we've covered an awful lot today. I'm amazed at how the time has flown by. There's an awful lot here. And we still have got two more rounds of questions, which I know we're just not going to get to. So look, what I thought I might do is to end this session by just going around and seeing if there's a closing comment from each of the editors on the panel, just to, uh, to as, as a way of just finishing, closing off this panel before Lee Jolliffe does the next keynote. So Serena, might if I just circle back to you, um, if there's any sort of closing, short closing point you'd just like to make uh, for to wind the panel up. So uh, Serena, over to you. Hey, thanks, Perry. Uh, yeah, it's just um, last piece of advice. Uh, sometimes uh, scholars, uh, especially the younger one, but all of us, we get to the findings, we have almost finished the paper, we're really tired and it's obvious because the process is a long one. But then there is the issue of writing the conclusions, the discussions, the implications. I always recommend there to take a little distance, to take a few steps backward, to go back to your research questions and try to take time also and embrace other perspectives before you embark in writing what I consider one of the most important parts of your research where you have to how you tied up your initial research question and your theory to actually how you have incremented knowledge in our field. So that would be one way to gain depth and breadth in your research. And good Excellent. luck with your Very submission. good advice there. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Joseph, might I go to you in Japan? Again, one piece of advice or a, cl a closing thought yeah. that you pass on? Yeah, yeah, very good. I, I will just uh, um, um, be quick. Um, as Dimitri said, don't, Dimitri said, don't question the integrity of editors and reviewers. Very often when people get rejected, they send a nasty email saying that the reviewers <laughs> don't know what they're talking about. Because most editors and reviewers review across journals, right? And if you get a desk rejection, make sure you make the changes because chances are, if it's, for example, about tourism and resilience, it will come to me if it's submitted to Demetrios. So I will have seen it before, right? So keep that in mind and good luck. All right, very good, very good, very good sobering advice there. Uh, Stanislav, Stan, have you got uh, uh, some, some closing advice to give to, to our audience? Yeah, I can only say that uh, authors should be bold because shy genes are not transferred. That's it. <laughs> they have to be bold. Aim big. That's it. Aim big. All right. Well, th thank you for that. Thank you for that. Demetrius, what about yourself? You've uh, you had a few comments on that. A last thought from you? I, I think we, we kind of covered a lot of uh, material and I think a lot of colleagues will find that useful. Um, on my YouTube channel, I've got some very long kind of presentations I've done in different universities. 
uh, where we kind of go step by step and they show the mechanics. And I think yeah. I think uh, people will, will benefit by uh, watching those and understanding what's happening. I think they should come forward and being part of the community. Uh, just remember, it's not a game; it's a community. And you know, like Joseph said, you know, anything that's that is that is on technology or smart or or things are gonna come to me wherever in whatever uh, uh, journal you are sending it. So if if I'm rejecting you from one journal, it's gonna I'm gonna reject you from the second journal until you've actually sorted out the things that we talked about <laughs> to improve the paper. And and you know. I can guarantee you that any paper on robotics is gonna go to Stan. Absolutely, and I, I know now he's reviewing style and I can see, yeah, Stan has uh, just reviewed that. Um, so I think, I think um, uh, colleagues who are listening and they'd like to take advantage, have a look on my YouTube on, on, the, on those long videos. I think one is two hours that explains all the mechanics and all the rest of it. I uh, think be part of the community, be a good citizen, uh, offer to do reviews, offer to engage, learn from the experience and be part of the community. And, yeah, and I, I, saw that, I saw that with encyclopedia as well, bring a community together, a global community that brings science forward. Thank you. And, and I think, Almost. you know, again, we made the point earlier, be part of that community, put your hand up, review, offer to do that. We're seeing more papers come in from India. We need reviewers who are prepared to put the time in because we all want reviewers who have got context as much as content for that, for, for where research is coming from. Metin, uh, from Turkey, over to you. To, to uh, uh, Any last thoughts or, or comments, advice? Okay, yes, uh, well, as the authors, we should carry on writing papers, editing journals, and also publishing new journals. This is the, you know, the circulation of our life. It, it should happen. The second thing I think I should say that we should pay more attention to quality other than quantity. And the third thing is that uh, I think uh, now we have so many opportunities, you know, because of different things in our life, in the world. So we can, I think, to just to increase the impact of, you know, uh, tourism research to other disciplines, we should uh, work together. With, we should collaborate with other people from different disciplines, at least to, I think, create a more, you know, impactful interdisciplinary research in, in tourism. I also advise, the, you know, the, the young scholars here to, to carry on, you know, working on their papers and they, even they get a rejection from any journal, they should go to the next one and so on. Well, a couple of weeks ago, we received a very fast test rejection from Dimitrios from social media. But now the paper was accepted by the second journal. So we are happy to have the paper perhaps coming out in the next couple of weeks, uh, months. So Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, sorry, mate, didn't apologize, but you there know, you go. Uh, <laughs> oh, we're tough to each other. And Gabby, to you, last but not least, for the final word here, your advice, okay. comments, thoughts uh, for, for our audience. Um, I would say that don't assume because there's a gap in the literature that the gap's worth filling. <laughs> and ask yourself, you know, there could be a reason why no one's um, addressed that gap in that it's not important and nobody cares. So ask yourself, so uh, the so what question. So why should people care about my research? Why should people be excited about my research? And, and really think about that carefully. Why will industry love this research? And why will my academic colleagues um, be interested in my research? So just always focus on that so what and, and um, look to really justify the importance of your research um, and its contributions, as opposed to just that there's a gap in the literature. Great. Well, look, thank you all very much for your considered advice and for joining us on the panel today. Uh, to Professor Serena Volo, I'd like to thank you from the International Journal of Culture, Tourism and Hospitality Research for joining us from Italy today. To Professor Metin Kozak, the Editor-in-Chief of Anatolia, thank you so much for joining us from Turkey. To Professor Stanislav Ivanov from the editor of the European Journal of Tourism Research, thank you very much for joining us from Bulgaria. 
to Dr. Uh, Associate Professor Gavin Walters, uh, my colleague, Associate and Editor of Journal of Vacation Marketing. Again, thank you thank so you. much for joining us. To uh, Professor Joseph Chia as co-editor of Tourism Geographies. Again, thank you so much for joining us from Japan. And uh, of course, to Demetrius, Professor Demetrius Buchalis, from Editor-in-Chief of Tourism Review for joining us this morning, your time from the UK. It's been wonderful to have participated in the GHTC conference this year. Uh, so I wish the rest of the conference, uh, you know, every success on that. I hope that this panel has been able to answer as many of the questions we got. We had over 20, something like 24 questions. I think we managed about 10, 10 of them during that, the, those rounds. Uh, hopefully this has given you some insights. I think the key words to take away from this are be part of that community, uh, put your hand up. I think there's been some very salient advice given, uh, receiving an increasing number of papers from India, which we're very pleased to receive. Uh, and I hope you enjoyed the rest of the conference. And I look forward to listening to our uh, next keynote speaker. I can see uh, Professor Lee Jolliffe has joined us there. I can see her on screen too. Uh, <laughs> good morning to you over there. Uh, it's great to have been part of this uh, event and uh, I look forward and would like to thank both the organizers and the editors for joining us today. My name again is Professor Perry Hobson, uh, editor of the Journal of Vacation Marketing at Sunway University in Malaysia. So again, thank you very much for, for, for being part of this session. Thank you one and all. Goodbye. Let's hope we'll be in uh, India next time, right? Because uh, Zoom is... Hmm. <laughs> it is what it is, as they say, and I look forward to that and traveling in person too. So with, right, with uh, Stan, we should be trying to you know, enjoy, I think, a spa and sauna in India. Oh, yes. yes. Incredible yeah. India. Yeah. That's right. Hands on research. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bye. Bye, everybody. Uh, Bye now. A very Thanks good again. afternoon to Thank everyone. You. So we have come to the end of the, our today's workshop, publishing in top tier tourism and hospitality journals held at GHTC Shillong. Uh, on behalf of all the participants present here, I extend my gratitude and sincere thanks to Professor Perry Hobson for chairing this session in an excellent flow, as well as making it interactive and enjoyable. We are more than privileged to have you all with us under one platform. I would also like to extend my heartfelt thanks to all the esteemed editor-in-chiefs and associate editor for sparing their valuable time out of their tight schedule and offering excellent insights and thoughts for the today's workshop. Almost all the problem areas for publishing in top tier tourism and hospitality journals are being addressed today by our participating editors. And we are very hopeful that this workshop will be of great help and will act as a guiding light for budding researchers to achieve their pursuits. Overall, the workshop has been a wonderful learning experience to one and all. Thank you so much, everyone, for your patient learning. Thank you once again.